So, what a sort of nice sort of selection, as I say, different price points. And um, sort of talk through each wine, tell you what it should go with, what to sort of look out for, without sort of getting sort of too technical about all the designated zones and what they taste of, etc. Um, just, you know, uh, an easy man's guide to uh, Italian wines. One thing I'd always sort of say, no matter where you go to buy your wines or whatever restaurant you're going to, is, you know, ask the person who is looking after the wines, what do they think, and get a bit of guidance from them in the shop or in the restaurant, because they're the ones who should know, they're the ones who should have tasted, so, you know, that's... People don't do that often enough, and if it's a, a place of, of merit, you know, they should be able to discover and uncover some great gems that you might not normally try. Hence, that's why I've brought some a few more obscure things. So, starting off, we brought the uh, Nonda's House Merlot, which is uh, bottled for us in the Veneto area. A lot of people have heard of Merlot, and it's quite a default choice of people. And sort of the good thing about uh, this particular Merlot is it's very light embodied, nice medium sort of fruit, and it's more of an everyday type of wine. So it's good to sort of uh, uncomplicated, and and it mixes with quite a lot of dishes, you know, whether it's pasta dishes, ragoutis, chicken dishes, etc. Uh, right, nice, simple, easy sort of fruit. But I think it's also important to try and discover what sort of style of wine it is. We talked about before whether it's um, soft, easygoing, medium, more full-bodied, more tannins. I think once you've got the grasp of that, then you can match it up with the food and therefore enhance the wine experience. So sort of moving along the tree, so to speak. So this one here is called Morolino di Scansano. Well, I've never have heard of it. Classically Italian, it's a, a, a Tuscan wine. It's grown on the coast uh, below sort of Pisa, a coastal wine. And Morellino is actually a variety of Sangiovese, which is the more popular wine of Tuscany, Chianti. So it's a, a, a clone of that sort of grape. And again, lots of sort of different sort of styles of, of, of that variety itself. This particular one is, um, it's an entry level wine, a bit more, a bit slightly more body than this uh, Merlot from uh, Veneto here, uh, a bit more sort of structure, sort of primary fruits, quite sort of light in tannins. Okay, what does it taste like? What will it go with? Great with salamis, parma ham, etc. Perfect, nice with the spaghetti bolognese, great, etc. As we sort of move along there, we're sort of going upwards in the trail of these wines here of body, price and sort of complexity. As I sort of suggest the, uh, the dishes that sort of go with it, it's to sort of match that sort of style of wine. So one point we've talked about Italian wines is that, that typicity and that sort of knowledge of uh, the person who's advising you on wine. And um, some of my best finds of wines and things that have made it onto our list at Nonna's is, is from advice from other people. And uh, we talked about La Baita, one of my favorite Tuscan restaurants, it does a fantastic steak. Uh, the waiter took his advice and he kept bringing me this particular wine, Capatosta. Didn't know anything about it, didn't know the grape, didn't know anything. So I um, so took a picture of it and found the uh, address of the producer, emailed the producer, said, really like your wine, etc., etc. Fast forward four years, five years, I think, we now list its baby brother and the big brother on the wine list at Nonda's. The producer comes over, we've done dinners with him. He's almost a friend now, etc. And it all happened from one way to giving me a bottle of wine that he thought was good. So what 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 is this wine? So... It's made with uh, Morellino, which is the Sangiovese, and another great variety called Alicante. Back to the body, much more body in there, much more robust, much more firm tannins in there. And those tannins need to have food. 
they need need food and one of the greatest you know it matched so well to the florentine steak these big firm sort of tannins in there and what it does by sort of eating the meat and having this tannic wine it softens those tannins in there and gives you know you start getting extra sort of taste perceptions from it so another interesting story like great frappato lovely name quite nice rings off the uh, off the tongue and this little great Nerello Mascalese mamma mia that's a mouthful for anyone and this grape variety is from Sicily, indigenous of Sicily, grown on the, the slopes of Mount Etna, and they say it's actually the Barolo of the South. Okay. What, what does that mean? Um, so Barolo is what, like one of the kings of Italian wines, a very well-known wine from the Piemonte region, made with a grape variety called Nebbiolo, which actually is it's quite pale in color, actually. It's not big, full and vibrant. And um, young, it's sort of very, very sort of tannin and needs plenty of three, four years minimum of sort of aging, etc. So it's, it's real robustness to it. So this Nerello Marchese, which is grown on slopes of Etna, uh, is that style, that, back to that sort of style of grape. But what they've done here, mix it with this frappato, another indigenous grape, which is a bit more sort of a, a fruit driven sort of grape. So you've got two indigenous grape varieties uh, mixing to produce a, a, a wonderful wine from the area there. And it's sort of medium bodied, medium bodied on, on that one. And I think it's, for me it's great, great value for money. Moving along, so like this is a, a wine from the bottom of Lake Garda. Again, not really an area that you think of for sort of great wine. Again, I was sort of introduced to this by uh, uh, sort of a colleague, and this is one of those wines we talk about. I love doing the game of value of this. I say, try this. What do you think? It's made of the great Mazamina. Who's heard of Mazamina? No one. Barbera. You might have heard of Barbera. Um, Barrique aged for two years. Great. What does that do? It sort of softens it, gives it a real sort of finesse and real sort of structure and elegance to it. And I always do is give it to people and say, try this, what do you think? What do you think it is, price-wise? And they all they always say higher than it actually is. So to me, it's one of those great quality wines. Not a cheap wine. Not a cheap wine, but let's have a so let, let's let oh it's a tiny drop hey. whoa whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so, so um when the, the nothing on sort of glasses etc etc um it is always nice to drink wine out of a good glass definitely it and you know if you ever get into Rydell glasses, etc., and they have a different wine glass for every sort of grape variety. That's the sort of total extreme of it. But a good wine glass does mean that, you know, you are able to sort of, you know, why do they swill it to get some of those sort of, you know, aromas out there so you can stick your beak in there. When we come to the sort of this top of the tree one, they almost call it a, a, a meditati meditazione wine, like a meditating wine, because you, you're, you're savouring that wine and you're savouring that taste and that length and flavour. So, uh, you know, that's uh, another you know, great easy tip. You know, taste it. Is it short? Is it long? Has it got a good bit of length? Got it persistent? How does it feel in your mouth? That's your, that's your indicator to what you should be eating with it. If it's bigger and robust, then it can take bigger and robust food. If it's soft and delicate, then you may need a bit more lighter food with it. So, we talked about earlier about Italians and how they make things so like complicated and hard to follow. We touched on Barolo, we touched on that Nebbiolo grape. So that grape, Nebbiolo, grown in Valtellina, is called a totally different name. Great, now you can follow that, it's called Chiavinesca, wow, okay. So what they do, they, remember we said it's sort of almost like a, a light, uh, in colour, wine etc what they do with it there they dry the grape out like amarone 
okay? So that you end up with a, a wine that looks sort of like pale in color, but really sort of intense or deceptively powerful. And I think that's about 15, 15%. So, you know, this is not a, it's not a quaffing wine. It's definitely not a quaffing wine. Talking about it in such an evocative way, almost don't want you to open it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's all, all for the purposes of trying and testing. So, you know, let, so. So, hang on, why, why that shape for that? Well, because, you know, we talked about um, it's quite an evolved wine. It's got lots more sort of characteristics in there and you want them to sort of come out of this wine, giving it a, a bit more room to sort of aerate it in the wine glass. So, you know, we'll pour a little bit in, you've got more room to swell it, get that, those flavours out there and really sort of release. And it makes it sound almost if you describe it as if it's a slower wine. We, you did use the word meditative, didn't you? Yes, exactly. And, you know, uh, really, we should have opened this a couple of hours before because uh, we get into sort of like the much more complex chapters of wine and you, you start, you know, when you hear about these people talking, oh, it's leathery, it's tobacco, it's this, that and the other. And you've got like levels of flavour, primary flavours, fruit. Primary flavours, something that's a, a bit more evolved and it's got a bit of tannins, and you might get a bit of sort of leatheriness in there, etc. Something that has evolved even more, etc. Then you start getting some of these tertiary flavours, earthy, mushroomy, leathery, etc. And you know, something like that really needs a bit of time to sit back and savour and appreciate, you know one, what's gone into it, and, um, you know, all, all sort of that hard work. So this, like here, we can see, it's actually a very, very sort of white in colour. And, uh, you know, don't be afraid, you know, you might spill a bit of wine when you're swirling it around, so what? Just you know, give it a good sort of swirl and stick your nose in and, you know, what do, what do you smell? So. No, straight away, you have a smeller, smell that, and then we'll smell something. That smells almost like a, uh, like a liqueur, it's uh, mm. almost port-esque. Yeah, yeah, port -esque absolutely. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, you know, a, a great thing, it's great, you know, get your friends around, grab a few different bottles, try, taste, compare them, because that's the good thing is, you know, when you start comparing it. So now, smell that one. Yeah, that smells like Ribena now. Exactly, yeah, definitely. It smells like Ribena. So as we sort of progress from this Merlot, simple, nice primary, this one was the Capitosta, so a bit more sort of body to it. And this one, the much more evolved uh, Sfusa, it's called. You can tell. You don't have to have any degree in wine. You can tell well, that's different from that. That's different from that. That's different from that. So, if we did sort of the advanced class and get some food out and sort of say, right, okay, let me try uh, some. Which does the gorgonzola blue cheese go with? And taste it with each one. And, you know, make, you make the choice. Okay, so we've got some grabbed some cheese and some uh, walnuts there, okay. and well, I've. I've had um, cheese and wine before, cheese and biscuits and wine, that's a great combo, isn't it? But nuts, not so much. Um, one of my favorite combinations is pecorino and honey. So pecorino is like a, a hard cheese, like a, a Parmesan sort of style cheese, obviously quite grainy. And in Tuscany, they have it a lot with honey. That's a nice sort of unusual combination as well. Maybe a bit of pear as well. Um, the the gorgonzola here, sort of that strong, sweet, um, robust sort of flavour, and you know we were back to describing how this Sfusat wine was is, you know that's a sort of nice combination. So adding nuts on there, it's just like a like another sort of a texture as well, isn't it? And getting some of that sort of nuttiness and that, er that I think earthiness. That's, that's where it is, and you know, especially a wine like this, it's, it's got that ethereal, earthy 
contact, etc. And if you ever read the geeky stuff about Barolo, which go back to it, Barolo, Nebbiolo grape, same sort of grape, slightly different area. They all talk about violets, tar, woodlandy, etc. And then, you know, we, we hinted on matching stuff to that area. So, Piemonte, what are they having? Truffles, wild mushrooms, big sort of robust food, and they need a big sort of robust wine to sort of go with it. What we will do in the uh, in some of the, the future ones is uh, some of like my grappers, like my digestivos, etc. is another minefield, and there's another great one which is really coming to the forefront. It's Aperol. What's that? Aperol is for one of a better. It's like a a, a cordial, but like a, a Campari cordial, cordial like made out of bitters, etc. All ancient recipes, been around donkey's years. And you have it with uh, um, it's low in alcohol, it's about 20%. You have it with sort of soda, have it with white wine and soda, have it with Prosecco and Aperol. And you almost get this, uh, looks like Tizer, but it's great. Did you say Tizer? Tizer, looks <laughs> like Tizer, yeah. <laughs> and it's like a fantastic aperitivo and it's very Venetian, etc. Everyone has uh, Aperol and Prosecco. And, so we're fortunate we've been having it for a sort of long time. Now it's become sort of like a bit sort of trendy, etc. Everyone's sort of on the bank went, oh, let's have an Aperol spritz. So uh, that's my... So you want to look forward to? Definitely. Aperol spritz, that's the future. Great stuff. Great. We'll catch you next time. That's great. Cheers. Okay, good. Take care.